All right. Uh, welcome back this week. I've got a couple of things that I want to go over uh, briefly to help you out with uh, the reading this week and to watch uh, for a couple of things. This is my uh, one of my favorite lectures, and I'm slightly disappointed that I can't give uh, this lecture to you in class. I think that it's uh, better when we have this discussion, which um, which isn't a big deal, but uh, I, I'm excited at least to provide this video that should give you some sense of the transition between uh, the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, and then into the rise of Christianity. Okay, um, this week, what I want you to be looking for is that those tra the pieces or characteristics of that transition between uh, Republic and Empire. Okay. Uh, really, there's a couple things that I want you to be aware of is that um, the empire takes control of the entire Mediterranean. There's this growth of trade and prosperity that takes place and then everyone becomes Roman instead of these individual tribes like we had seen uh, during the Republic. Okay, And so the empire as it grows, as other places are conquered, then those people are uh, really enveloped into being Roman. Uh, the government becomes less, uh, there is a less role of, uh, lesser role of assemblies, a uh, large role of the Senate, uh, wealthy, wealthy men of good character uh, are supposed to be elected into offices and they're going to give you a high moral standard that you should be living by. Um, there are, there's more control at the local municipalities uh, or tribal governments, and so things are working very well, and then you have this overarching emperor that's uh, over everything, right? If we're talking about um, morality, traditional family values takes hold at this point. I mean, this is, we've seen this throughout time, um, but the Roman Empire will have this idea of traditional family values. There'll be laws uh, against adultery and divorce, and uh, marriage, and sex specifically is for procreation, okay? And we start to see that early on. So these are some of the transitions that you're going to see this week uh, between em Republic and Empire, okay? I would definitely suggest looking into the military, and I'll, I'll just run through what I'm looking for specifically, is that there's a large Roman army that's out on the periphery or out on the frontier, especially the northern frontier. They're a professional military. Uh, it's a 20-year enlistment. It, they get a paid pension um, or a, they get paid and they get a pension. Uh, they bring Roman culture to the periphery or these tribes on the edges and that strengthens Rome. As the, as the military moves out, uh, they start to marry these women out on the edge, and now those children are becoming Roman, which makes this uh, unified in some sense. And so people are uh, kind of proud to be Roman as these uh, as the military moves out. And so I, <clears throat> this is my own uh, take on uh, the transition. I believe that the uh, military is what pushed the republic to an empire okay as they as it continued to grow those military men would stay there or those soldiers would stay there they would create families and then those families would be roman and you'd get a bigger sense or more pride for being um, roman and that i believe is one of the major factors to the transition between uh, the roman republic and the empire okay let, now, let me transition into the rise of Christianity. The rise of Christianity, I think we're going to talk about uh, next week. And so we've got a unit two exam or the midterm exam coming up at the end of this week. Uh, at, but there will be a question on the rise of Christianity. Um, and then you're going to see next week maybe how that um, contributes to the breakdown uh, or the fall of Rome. Okay, so the rise of Christianity of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, a, one book that I would suggest reading if you're interested in, in learning more about this history is uh, Jesus of Nazareth uh, or Zealot, Zealot Jesus of Nazareth by Reza Aslan, which is a phenomenal book. Uh, it does not, it takes away all of the spiritual pieces and just gives you a history. And I think that that it's a phenomenal way. Reza Aslan does a great job of explaining just the history. I think that's an important piece to understand. Um, we've got these statements of faith 
that are the Gospels in the Bible. That's where we get a lot of this history. But there is several other historians that write about Jesus at this time with just mentions of him. Uh, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John uh, are written 70 to 100 years after the death, uh, or 70 to 100 uh, BCE uh, or AD. So we're talking 35 plus years after Jesus died or was crucified, uh, do we start to get these statements of faith? Okay, and that's really a big piece that we need to understand here that these, the gospels uh, in the Bible are statements of faith, okay? Uh, Christianity grows throughout the empire and beyond. The great success in the beginning is the urban poor and rural farmers and uneducated. Um, I generally have this discussion in class on why is it that this, these groups are gravitating towards this. And I, I kind of want you to flesh that out yourself. I, I would love to have a discussion, but I think that the best way to do this is for you to flesh that out. Why is the urban poor, rural farmers, and uneducated, why are the, one, the, the ones that are gravitating? And then why are there very few wealthy that are gravitating towards this? Reza Aslan does a great job of explaining that, in, in Zealot at least, that some of the reasons that these people are, are gravitating is because this message is really for uh, poor people. It's one that brings them together. And I'll get to that in just a second. And then uh, Christianity also has this idea of participation in the community. And that participation is what's going to fuel a lot of people to, um, to push Christianity uh, within their communities, right? This idea of participating within the community. And now uh, I'm a Christian who's going to help other Christians uh, be more involved, okay? There's this appeal of Christianity uh, that I'd like you to look at this week. Spiritual equality. Obviously, that's the biggest, one of the biggest pieces about the urban poor, rural farmers, and uneducated people is that they have this equality all of a sudden. Um, it's not necessarily uh, temporal equality. It is spiritual equality. It doesn't matter where you come from. Jesus taught this idea that we were all going to go back and live with God and we're going to be on this same plane. And so spiritual equality, big piece of the appeal of Christianity. Warmth and human appeal. Uh, before these gods were people that we couldn't see. Um, they kind of, they sat up on Mount Olympus or wherever these gods were, and there wasn't uh, a lot of warmth or human appeal. And, and Jesus does that, right? Christianity has this warmth about it. And then uh, wealthy looking out for the poor. The poor love this, and the wealthy start to think, well, I can gain uh, more blessings or whatever it may be if I am uh, good to, to the poor, okay? Now, there's quite a bit of persecution of Christians, especially in the early years. Uh, they denied pagan gods, and they didn't worship the emperor. This is going to be a huge issue when we see the fall of Rome because now, uh, it, especially the poor, are not worshiping the emperor. They don't see him as uh, deity. Instead, they see Jesus as deity. They're going to follow him. They're going to try to live the laws, but Christianity is what they're living, right? Um, they start to pull away from civic affairs and just think of things as spiritual matters, okay? Uh, They've got these organized networks of associations, and those organized networks kind of grow up and become these uh, organizations that supersede, in, in a way, when you're talking about spiritual health uh, or well-being, supersede what it is that the government is doing for you, okay? Um, and then bi the biggest thing, and this is on page 150 of, Western, uh, of our Western Heritage book, is unity, okay? Uh, page 150 talks about unity and how it is that uh, Christians unify and this is a reason for persecution. Is that as you see this gro group building up, that the emperor wants to obviously get rid of them because they're going to rise up. Now this changes by 360. Uh, you start to see Christianity taking a bigger role. So by 360 uh, CE or AD, sorry, um, we're going to see people start to, or Christianity becoming uh, the main religion. And in 394, um, we see Theodosius forbids uh, pagan celebrations. And that's kind of the, like, hey, we're, we've made it. Christianity has made it. And uh, we're not really going beyond that. Uh, anyway, and 
we're not going to be persecuted like they had been uh, previously. Okay, uh, in three sixty, Julian the Apostate tries to undo Christianity by el uh, eliminating Christians from the government offices, but that doesn't work because there's so many Christians who are already in in there. And then we have the Nicene Creed and uh, some of these things that you'll read about this week. So, what I really would like you to do this week is see the rise of Christianity. Uh, kind of understand what's going on there. And then as we move past the mid midterm, then next week we'll talk about um, how Christianity or that rise of Christianity really breaks down uh, Rome, okay, and the Roman Empire. So that's, that's this week. I realize that this video is a little longer than normal. Uh, I hope that this helps in picking out some characteristics this week. If you have any questions, please email me, call me, stop by my office. Uh, I'm around almost all the time. So we'll talk to you later. Have a good week.